Let us all cultivate the altruistic motivation seeking complete enlightenment for the sake of liberating infinite kind mother sentient beings. It's with that kind of bodhicitta motivation that we should all participate in this teaching. I just want to emphasize this point that all of us uh, should try to um, you know, do our, our spiritual uh, practice or engage in spirituality uh, uh, properly and uh, you know, perfectly. <laughs> Tonight, Now, why we really need to cultivate uh, spirituality um, purely and perfectly, if you will, is because um, it is uh, the source of everything that we would like to uh, fulfill and accomplish. In other words, um, uh, lasting peace and happiness uh, and uh, the best of everything that we see uh, it comes from spirituality or dharma. And all the things that we do not want, that we would like to get rid of for good, it is through spirituality, through the cultivation of spirituality, that um, we are able to get rid of uh, all those undesirable uh, uh, things. Uh, other than uh, cultivating spirituality purely and properly, uh, there are no other, uh, how should I say, uh, you know, methods or um, uh, means uh, by which we can fulfill all our wishes. Uh, we could have uh, many uh, great friends, but our friends cannot uh, really, uh, how should I say, help us get rid of all the things we do not want or help us to fulfill all the things that we do want. Uh, we could be very rich. Uh, but material resources, again, are not the real causes of uh, uh, the kind of peace, happiness, and goodness that we are seeking. And material uh, you know, resources are not the solutions to get rid of all the things that we uh, do not want. 
so in the light of those things, um, as we uh, embark on spirituality, uh, it's very important for all of us uh, to uh, practice it uh, uh, purely and properly. And I feel it's also important for us uh, to uh, identify uh, what Dharma is or spirituality uh, is. Uh, Dharma is uh, a Sanskrit uh, term and it is a polysemantic term in that it has many shades of meaning. Uh, Dharma in a general sense, uh, it refers to uh, anything that exists or we call phenomena. Uh, according to that uh, understanding of Dharma, any phenomenon, uh, now this is where we get technical, uh, that is able to hold its own identity. Every phenomenon has its own identity. A phenomenon that can hold on to its identity is what we call Dharma in a general sense. So that's one of the understandings of Dharma. <laughs> Uh, what I'm trying to um, get across to you is that um, Sanskrit term Dharma, which in Tibetan is translated as Chu, uh, it has as many as ten different uh, uh, shades of meaning. And one of which I just uh, you know, gave it to you, everything that exists, you know, called Dharma. Uh, but another understanding of uh, the term Dharma or Che in Tibetan uh, is, uh, as we often say, spirituality. Now, by that, what we really mean is uh, it. Um, uh, refers to all kind of spirituality uh, which are uh, inclusive within what is known as the three higher trainings. Uh, in the uh, footnote, training in higher ethics, training in higher concentration or samadhi, and training in higher wisdom. And these three higher trainings are, as a matter of fact, uh, the contents of the subject matters of uh, what is known as three baskets of teaching or tripithikas. Uh, again, in the footnote, uh, there's the basket of discourses, Sutra Pithika, uh, there's the basket of um, discipline, Vinaya Pithika, <coughs> and then there is the basket of knowledge, Abhidhamma Pithika. So when we talk about spirituality here, you know, or Dharma, you know, to, to refer to that, what we are basically talking about is the three higher trainings and what is contained in the three baskets of uh, teaching or three <coughs> <coughs> Uh, in other words, um, Dharma in the sense of spirituality uh, that we are talking about here, of course, it originated with uh, historical Buddha Shakyamuni. Uh, he is the you know, founding teacher or the originator of this Dharma. And um, um, so when we think in terms of um, um, I mean, his uh, I mean, teaching, uh, his original teachings are contained in what are called sutras. Uh, or baskets of discourses. 
And then there are great Indian realized masters, not the intellectual scholars only, highly realized, evolved beings. Uh, they wrote commentaries on his teachings, uh, which are called commentarial treatises or in Sanskrit or Shastras. They are hundreds of volumes. So what is contained in the Sutras and Shastras is what we are talking about spirituality I mean, here. Um, uh, or in other words, that as we often do, um, Buddha Dharma or Buddha spirituality, it has two different aspects or the dimensions. Uh, one aspect is called uh, what are called scriptural dimension or scriptural teaching. So basically, what is contained in the volumes of sutras and shastras, okay, or Buddha's own original teachings as well as the commentary treatises written on his teachings. But another aspect of Buddha's teaching is, or the dimension is, what we call realization dimension, or the realization teaching. So that basically refers to, it's not something contained in the books or the scriptures, but it's what is contained in the minds and hearts of evolved beings or the practitioners. And this is where uh, we can talk about uh, the five uh, spiritual paths, or the whole structure of the path for the five spiritual paths, again in the footnote, from the path of accumulation to the path of normal learning. And within these five spiritual paths, uh, we can also talk about, of course, according to Mayana Buddhism, uh, ten spiritual grounds of Bodhisattvas, or ten spiritual levels, called the Dasha Bhumi in Sanskrit. So these are what we call the uh, realization dimension of Buddha's teaching. So when we talk about Dharma in the sense of spirituality, that's what we are talking about. What is contained in Sutras and Shastras, as well as the realization dimensions that I just mentioned. Five spiritual paths and the ten spiritual grounds. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Choosing <laughs> So the bottom line is this, that when we talk about uh, spirituality or the Dharma in the, in the sense of spirituality or Buddha's teaching, uh, that's what we're talking about. It's the complete structure of the path. So it's not enough to call something uh, spirituality or Dharma. Uh, because anything probably could be labeled as spirituality in some sense, maybe. But what's really important is whether that complete structure of the path is something that we as individual practitioners can cultivate within our own mind, that we can progress on this complete structure of the path, that we can find uh, the spiritual goals that we are seeking. So in a broader sense, what we are really seeking is complete freedom from samsara or cyclic existence, okay, which is called nirvana or nibbana. And, you know, beyond that, in some sense, you know, we want to be completely enlightened being. We want to be Buddhas, okay? So spirituality that we talk about is, it's not something that's labeled as spirituality, but whether that really uh, has the complete structure of the path that we ourselves can put into practice and cultivate, and we can experience all the things that we are talking about, and that we evolve spiritually, and that we are liberated from samsara, that we become completely enlightened beings eventually. Okay, that's what we are talking about. So the point I'm trying to make here is, you know, so we should not be kind of, how should you say, um, uh, I'm satisfied you know, anything that's called Dharma or spiritual or Chu in Tibetan. Okay, we really need to investigate what is it really and whether it can really lead us to the spiritual destinations or the goals that we would like to accomplish or go to. Okay, so it's not a, you know, uh, what well, label, you know, the labeling could also, in some sense, doesn't mean what is being labeled is what it really stands for. So we have to be really careful uh, not to kind of, uh, you know, get caught up with just the labels. 
so what I have been explaining to you is that all of us should um, be able to identify what kind of spirituality or chi or dharma that we are talking about here and what does it mean to practice it purely or to engage in pure spirituality. So by that what I really mean is you know, for a spirituality to be authentic and pure, that it must be able to help us counteract our own deluded states of mind. Each of us has got you know, tons of delusions inside us. Okay? So if something is really pure spirituality, or if we are engaging in the pure spirituality or practicing it purely, then what should really happen is that we are able to get rid of uh, the delusions from within our mind, that we are able to get purify ourselves of all the negative karmas that we have already accumulated. We have already done that, been there, and now only thing is we could get rid of them, purify ourselves of that. And that we do not create any new negativities or contaminated karmas that would otherwise precipitate our rebirths in samsara, that would bring us back, you know, to samsara over and again. And uh, anything let's put with that helps us to do that, then we can call it pure spirituality. Anything that helps us to counteract our deluded states of mind, that helps us to get rid of the negative karmas, that helps us not to create any new negative karmas, well, then really that is a pure spirituality. <laughs> And here also it's very important for us to I mean, understand and as a matter of fact to remind ourselves that all the things that we are talking about here, it involves personal responsibility. Right? If we would like to you know, experience pure spirituality, if we want to be free from all the delusions and negativities, then whose responsibility is it? you know, to free ourselves from all the stuff, uh, or the delusions and so forth. So basically, we as individuals need to do our practice. Practice is personal responsibility. We cannot assign it to somebody else, or we hope that somebody else will do that for us. It doesn't work that way. It's just we need to do it ourselves. <laughs> In the case of ordinary sickness, well, maybe there are other ways that other people can do something for us. Like, say, we have some kind of uh, problem with certain organs in our body. Okay. Well, you know, somebody else can do the surgery and get that thing out. You know, fix that. And um, can fix that problem. Okay. You know, but when it comes to, uh, if we use that same metaphor, that the Buddha is uh, the best doctor or the physician we can find, you know, and uh, Dharma is the best medicine that is there to cure our sickness of delusions and negativities. Then, in this case, I mean, we as individuals, if we are the people who are suffering from the sicknesses of delusions and negativities, we need the best medication and we need to take that medication ourselves. Okay? And uh, so the example that I gave you earlier, if we have uh, some kind of a problem in, in, uh, in, uh, in our body, maybe you know, a great uh, surgeon can just you know, fix it, you know, remove the thing, you know, whatever you know, he or she need to do. 
But when it comes to uh, treating us of all our delusions and all these kind of issues and problems, then others cannot do that. There is no surgery that can remove the delusions from our system. You know, the only way is we have to recognize that Buddha is the best doctor in this case, and uh, Dharma or the spirituality that he has provided us is the best treatment and medication, and we are the ones who need that medication, and we need to take that medication. But if uh, the, uh, this problem or delusions, uh, you know, it is something that, uh, you know, through surgery can be removed by, you know, doctors, I tell you, then all the rich people will be ahead of us, <laughs> because they have the money and they can pay it and get rid of out of that system, but, you know, it doesn't work. You know. But in the case of, you see, when it comes to uh, the study and practice of Dharma, we truly have the equal rights, and we are on a really equal footing and a fair ground. Somebody could be completely a bomb, uh, out on the street, has nothing, and you, nobody respects him or her or whatever, but he's really truly interested in the study, of the, uh, the study and practice of Dharma, he or she could be ahead of the rich people, the famous people, the high status people, the influential people, you know, because it, mm, there is no limitation to say that you, know, you are a bomb, so you just I mean, are stuck in your kind of a predicament. There's no such thing when it comes to the practice of Dharma, so everybody has equal uh, rights, and um, it's we are really uh, on a, on a uh, how should I say, fair playing ground. So, the social social the social the so if Dharma is one's personal responsibility to cultivate it, you know, uh, then we're, what we all need to do is see that um, in our everyday life that our mind uh, is really, how should I say, turned into, directed into spirituality. So that's why the and of course, it's very important for us to have, um, you know, um, unshakable faith or conviction in the in spirituality or dharma. Yeah. <laughs> So when I say that we need to cultivate unshakable faith or conviction in Dharma, of course I'm not at all talking about, okay, we let's, you know, have a blind belief or the faith in the Dharma. And that's not going to work and that's not going to last anyway. So, but the kind of faith that we are talking about, the faith that arises out of deep understanding and based upon authentic reasonings. Okay? And so how do we do that is that... Um, for us to cultivate faith in Buddha, enlightened being, and Dharma spirituality, we need to study and understand uh, their qualities. Okay, and so as we understand the preeminent qualities of Buddha and Dharma, then you know, based upon that understanding, you know, we are able to cultivate uh, 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 you know unshakable faith uh, in Buddha and uh, uh, Dharma. Mm-hmm. So as spiritual practitioners, Dharma practitioners, we all need to study qualities of Buddha, Dharma and Sangha so that we are able to really develop faith and trust in them completely, understanding based on, not just simply blindly following them, what somebody tells us they are great and super duper, uh, that doesn't work. Uh, and uh, also we need to cultivate a compassion, you know, this you know, a wish 
uh, wishing everybody else, all other beings, to be free from suffering and its causes. So we need to cultivate compassion or karuna in Tibetan called ninje, uh, you know, to and for uh, other sentient beings. <laughs> In order to be able to genuinely cultivate compassion for others, I think we must also cultivate love for sentient beings. You know, without love, it would be hard to cultivate compassion uh, for others. In uh, I think if we, um, you know, look into our own life experiences, uh, you know, we will be able to get a sense of what I'm talking about here. That, you know, because of our love for, you know, our family members or friends or, you know, these other people, we consider them as very near and dear to us. So when anything happens to them, any problem suffering befalls them, you know, we develop a sense of compassion. We truly wish them to be free from their problems and suffering. Why? Because of that love connection, we care for them. Okay? And uh, so, I mean, when the, if, if that uh, love is intense, then our compassion also gets intense. You know, in some sense, you like, you know, we can say that, okay, if there's a way I can take that suffering upon myself, because we love so much that other person or those other people or whatever, right, we are really willing to do that. You know, we truly wish them to be free from suffering, and we think that if that's where I can share it, or I can get it, and then he or she or they can be free, you know, uh, we are ready to do that. So because of that love connection, is a compassion arises, and you know. So this is what I'm talking about here. So we need to cultivate love for sentient beings so that we're able to cultivate compassion uh, for them. Of course, uh, you know, love for sentient beings does not arise on its own. It's not easy to just, you know, pop up or cultivate. Uh, that requires, uh, you know, mind training and uh, I mean, education and studies. And, uh, but to be able to uh, love uh, all other sentient beings, we also need to establish that connection with all others and what others have done, the good things, you know, that they have done, uh, I mean, uh, for us. So when I say others, I literally mean all others, including the, what we call enemies now, okay? Other times, they were not always enemies, you know, all the time, but they were great friends. And so, as friends, they have rendered tremendous kindnesses to us. So now, as we try to reflect on all the good things others have done, you know, for us, then, you know, we really develop that love connection, you know, uh, with them. Mm. So um, there are ways we can uh, train our mind in which we are able to see that all sentient beings who are normally, maybe we categorize them into friends, strangers and enemies, and react to them very differently, treat them. But when we really think in terms of how everybody has, you know, been kind to us, you know, we kind of put them on equal footing. All of them have been equally kind to us in one or another way at different times, okay? So from that point of view, we cannot treat them differently, because if they have been equally kind to us, so we should be equally kind to them, they care about uh, them. So it is in that sense, from that perspective, you know, if we are in the habit of saying like, you know, you, I know, you have never done anything to and for me, and you know, uh, we can't say that. See, I mean, there is no you to point and say, you know, you have nothing to do with me or I have nothing to do with you. you know? I don't care you. And maybe we also sometimes think in the habit of saying like, oh, I don't care about you. You know, uh, or just to make the point, you know, Gisela will never say, to, you know, I just, you know, 
I'll just say, I'm damned with you. That has nothing to do with me or with you. So we can't say those things, and we actually not only say, but can't think in those ways. You know, when we find ourselves, you know, uh, thinking that way, that somebody, I don't care at all, damn you, or that, you know, we said, I don't care, whatever you think about me, or all that stuff, maybe because of our own uh, perception and limitations, because we are only thinking about this life, you know. So our logic is, I mean, this life, you have nothing connection with me, and I have nothing to do with you, so because, I mean, who are you, you know? Who am I to you? We are just total strangers, and maybe we are enemies, you see? So when we think only in terms of this lifetime, then all those limitations come up. But what I'm really talking about, the whole philosophy and the uh, I mean, theory behind this is, we have connections made over many lifetimes. This is not only life. So if somebody has no connection to us in this life, or hasn't done anything good to us in this life, we can cannot conclude that, you know, this is the person, you know, I don't care, you know, you, you just can't say that, because in other lifetimes and over the period of many lifetimes, you know, this person has done many great things, you know, for us. Okay, let's go back to where we left off um, I mean, last time uh, before I left for uh, Mexico to teach. Uh, remember that um, uh, the Tibetan um, and the king uh, in the western part of Tibet um, met with his kind of uh, final request to great Atisha, said, could you please once again give us sort of a you know, pit instructions here. And um, so then Atisha started to uh, I mean, uh, give them I mean, instructions. So we already dealt with a few points, and I hope you remember them. So I'm just going to, um, I should say, highlight the points we have dealt with. I'm not going to re-explain them. I already explained those points. Uh, one of the points uh, Adisha made was, you know, until one becomes an enlightened being, one reaches complete enlightened state, but one must cultivate uh, authentic uh, spiritual uh, uh, teacher or guru. Okay, one has to depend on a guru. <laughs> and another point that Adisha made was like until one realizes the ultimate uh, nature of phenomena one should continue to uh, listen to teaching or receive instructions. No. And the third, another point he made was uh, that it's not enough to intellectually understand Dharma or spirituality, but what's more important is to cultivate it within one's mind, to put it into practice. So that, and another point Adisha made was that how important it is for us to be able to isolate ourselves from, you know, the, the, the as I use the word in Gisela uh, Gode Muse, like hustle and bustle of our lives. <laughs> and and uh, it's just the hustle and bustle could be understood, you know, in two different ways, that there's the whole, this um, physical environment, all kind of noises and distractions happening. So we need to isolate ourselves from that to be able to do practice. But hustle and bustle can also be in the mind, you know, this whole mental gossip and all kind of stuff, you could be in a complete perfect solitude, but the mind is so busy, it's really like, you know, gossiping like anything, and that doesn't work. And, hustle bus, okay, next time. Hey, yeah, this sounds so much. And, hey, draw, hey, 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 hey,
And then another point uh, Adesha made was that we uh, should not cultivate uh, friends, uh, you know, who, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, who will, um, the way it is put, is generate, uh, you know, delusions or negativities in us. In other words, do not cultivate, you know, people as friends, you know, associating with them that we experience more delusions or become more deluded and so on. Yeah. That and uh, the the other side of the same coin so to speak is cultivate friends you know who um, by being with them or associating with them that we prosper in virtues that we always find ourselves doing positive and good things yeah. So I think I probably explained this to you that you know, it's very important that who is in our uh, proximity or the vicinity, you know, all the people, you know, the people we cultivate as friends or our companions, yeah, you know, because you know, there's influence, you know, from them. That so then you give me new so that I mean, it's been a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of but when we say friends, of course, you know, maybe in the English language, perhaps, you know, friends, we only think in terms of uh, you know, animate beings. You know, it could be like human being or maybe a dog and a cat, but we probably can't call inanimate objects my friends in some sense. But here, what we're really talking about is, it's not only the humans and the beings, you know, in our proximity or vicinity, but we are talking about, you know, uh, forms and sound and smell, all these inanimate things, because these are the sensual objects which you know, uh, gives rise to uh, delusions in our mind. Yeah. Then to say you never 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 You never never control You never never control uh, as um, great Indian master Acharya Vasubandhu uh, states in his uh, Abhidhamma Kosha or Treasure of Knowledge, and Gishala quoted the lines from his memory, uh, which relates to the, to the point we are talking about, how we need to isolate ourselves from all the objects which could give rise to you know, delusions in our mind. So these objects are simply called friends in this context. So, you know, uh, is that uh, we should keep at distance those objects of phenomena uh, which may give rise to delusions in our mind. Now what happens is you know, when we come close to uh, you know, certain objects, because of <coughs> our own inappropriate mental applications, I know that's a big word, the Tibetan word is chumi yiche, you know, we just you know, think in a certain way. So because of our like, mental approach to these objects, it's an inappropriate mental approach, then due to this interaction, our inappropriate mental approach, and the objects are so close to us, then we experience deluded <coughs> states of mind. Okay, then the problem starts. So it's better to keep at distance those objects of the phenomena. Yeah. So not only that uh, we associate with objects or the people, you know, um, that uh, facilitate our, you know, positive thinking and positive actions, but it's also important for us to, you know, be, uh, to uh, look within our own mind, you know, to, um, to be mindful of what we are thinking and to investigate our own uh, state of mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, In our everyday life, it's very important for all of us to, as we say, protect our mind, safeguard our mind, because the mind is the forerunner of all our actions, right? We can basically perform three actions, physical action, verbal action, and mental action. And the one that runs the whole show, if I can talk that way, is the mind. Okay. And uh, so if we safeguard our mind, then things will be much better. Otherwise, you know, when our mind, uh, I should say, um, give rise to negative thoughts, 
then our actions also become negative actions. But when our mind is in a positive state, our actions also become positive. If our mind is in a neutral state, which is neither positive nor negative, then the actions are also neither positive nor negative. So you know how important the mind is, in what kind of state it is. So that is very important for us to protect our mind. So that's the same thing. Same girl that re Luta Nani Botel pay Lozon Day at the two men at the ton day in the was Lozon Day in the was. You know, that's same girl Lozon Day at the similar Lozon Day at the that church Tony Mato, their memories. When it comes to uh, training our body and speech, I think we really don't need to talk about Dharma or spirituality. There are other ways to train our body, train our speech. But when it comes to disciplining and to, you know, subduing our mind, then there's nothing else apart from spirituality or dharma. That's the only way we can train our mind. Yes, I may have told you this um, you know, story um, in the context of uh, Lambrim teaching, but anyway, I want to uh, retell the story to um, illust illustrate my point. Um, this proverb comes from ancient India. Uh, you know, as times when the kings, you know, they want to have some good time, go out into stroll. You see, instead of riding horse, sometimes they would ride elephants. You know, and uh, so there are those elephant experts, you know, uh, trainers, and they train the elephants really subdued, so that elephants really, uh, you know, don't run fast or you know do all weird stuff in the middle of anything, walking, but really listen to you, whatever you say to them. And so one day, uh, uh, a king said to the elephant trainers, you know, I'm, I want to just kind of uh, have a good time, go out. So why don't you bring the best elephant that you have trained? Okay, the most subdued elephant, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So the, uh, the elephant expert, uh, you know, he brought the best trained elephant, you know, under his uh, control and he kind of always trusted this elephant, you know, and so he put uh, a seat for the king on the elephant and then, you know, he um, also rode uh, with the king, you know, to, uh, as a kind of a driver, uh, elephant driver. Yes. So they kind of went far, you know, they crossed few valleys and mountains, and then at a certain point, this elephant started to pick up its pace, you know, it's like it started to speed up, you know. <laughs> And uh, so the elephant trainee was you know, doing all the um, tricks he knew, you know, how to train this. He was trying to, you know, tell the elephant just kind of slow down, you know, don't speed up. Might get a speeding ticket, I'm just kidding. Uh, there was no ticket. And, uh, but the elephant wouldn't listen. I just kind of, you know, uh, started to go run faster and faster. But what was really happening was this is the male elephant who started to get the scent of the female elephant somewhere in the valleys, you know. So I was going crazy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
So as they were approaching under some kind of a you know, tree, then the elephant trainee, he, he knew what was happening. So he knew that this elephant had started to you know, uh, smell the female elephant somewhere in the neighborhood. And so he know he couldn't do anything here, you know, because the elephant is going banana here. So he told uh, the king, you know what, uh, your majesty, I think you see we are coming near the tree, so we both need to get hold onto a branch of the tree and get off this elephant. You know, there's nothing much I can do. Okay. <laughs> so I mean, King listened to him, and, and of course they both held on to branches of the trees, and then the elephants just speeded up, you know. Uh, so the elephant is gone, you know, where to be seen, and then somehow they both, you know, walked back to the palace, found their way back to the palace. Yes. Yes. So the king was really angry with this elephant, uh, you know, trainer, you know, he thought, how could this be? Well, so he really wanted to, um, you know, punish him. Uh, yes. So the elephant trainee said, you know, Your Majesty, um, you know, the elephant will come back. So I would just plead you, you know, not to be in hurry, punishing me. Just wait for a while and let the elephant come back and then, you know, you can examine again, yeah. you know. That's a little bit. Say, so the elephant came back and then the trainee wanted to show you know how he trained this elephant well that basically it would do all crazy things he would tell the elephant to do normally so what he did was you know he um and started a fire and put a you know iron into the fire and let the iron catch fire completely red and then he ordered the elephant just go and pick it up with his trunk and elephant was ready to do it you know. and then really king was amazed how obedient this elephant is to him right he was ready to put his trunk into the fire and get that you know hot plate out so then the king said, no, no, stop it, you know, uh, that's enough. And they jabu kaji tibri, they call langzir kaji tibri. And so, any language they training, I was saying, you're saying, though, that, because I said, to Jesus, any language you can send the time due to your marriage, due to masons. You know, because you put that, like that, she had to come and call her, how could you just say, that she had a chance for us. So then the king said, you know, it seems like you have trained this elephant really well, but then what happened that other day, you know, it was speeding up. And then he said, you know what, Your Majesty, you know, the best training even I could give is only train this elephant physically, and I have to, you know, it can listen to some signals, but there's no way for me to train his mind. Okay, that's not under my domain, you know. And then the king said, well, is there anybody who can train the mind then? You know, if you can, can't do it, you can only do the training of the body. So is there anybody who can train mind? Yeah. So really, King got interested in the in mind training. You know, he wanted to learn about all the techniques. And then um, that was the time when Shakyamuni Buddha was. You know, it was uh, this King was a contemporary of Shakyamuni Buddha. So then, elephant training, and the King, uh, you know, went to visit the Buddha and learned, you know, about the practices, you know, training the mind. And then I think they both become highly realized. Mm -hmm. So the point I'm trying to make through all this story is that, you know, how important it is for us to train our mind. You know, if our mind goes, you know, crazy and banana, there's nothing much we can do about it. You know. mm -hmm. 
We really need to recognize that all the you know, thing, undesirable things happening to us, you know, uh, including suffering, it's not that somebody is out there is, is really designing every possible way to make our life miserable. It's basically our own mind, which is in a negative state, in a very deluded state, it is the real source of all our pains and problems. So as I mentioned earlier that uh, we can talk about um, our mind in either of the three different states. It could either be in a negative state, deluded state, or it could be in a positive state, or it could be in, in a neutral state, which is neither positive nor negative. Perhaps we don't need to worry too much about mind in a neutral state, because if mind is in a neutral state, it, it neither brings positive results nor negative results. So it's just, you know, that. But what we really maybe is concerned with is the differentiating uh, between negative state of mind and positive state of mind. No, no. Mm. So let me go back to where we left off in this uh, wonderful text called uh, A Miscellaneous Collection of Kadamba Geshe's Advices and maybe um, you know, go through one or two more points. Mm. <laughs> now here Adesha makes another point. He said, you know, there is no end to the worldly activities that one engages in. Just let go of those things and just relax. Just rest. Take a rest. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, he's uh, uh, demonstrating that, you know, just let go all the crazy things, endless things you need to do, and just, you know, relax. <laughs> and for uh, someone who is really completely dedicated in the spiritual practice, he or she there, right? That's what they need to do, or what, if we are those, we need to do. <laughs> But another way to understand this statement is like we think in terms of uh, activities of just this lifetime. We can never finish those. Our life is not going even to going to be long enough to do all the things we need to do in this life. No. <laughs> So I think maybe um, another interpretation that I'm giving you, maybe that is more relevant to us and maybe that's um, perhaps more acceptable to us, if you will. That of course we have to be realistic, right? If we stop doing anything, then who pays the bill? <laughs> Uh, we got to eat, uh, we got to pay the rent or, you know, house bill, whatever. So, I mean, we need to do certain things. We just can't drop every activities of this lifetime, you know, because life uh, needs those things. But don't do more than what is necessary. Don't drive ourselves over the edge and crazy. Yes, we have, you know, roof over the head, we have enough things to eat, we have, you know, clothes to put on, but then, you know, go and, uh, you know, you know that, right? Uh, so don't do that. Yes. Unnecessary things, uh, yes. don't do it. Yes. But those are what do you think, or what is the unnecessary things uh, for you? So what are the unnecessary things that we should not be doing all? Can somebody give some examples of the unnecessary things we do in life? That's song that I did, Tom Lodroya, down the table. Shopping, Google, 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 Google
Some in your gurus, Tulu in your gurus. Kesha said, I mean, don't we need to go for shopping? Otherwise, if we don't go to the grocery store, don't go to buy the, the department store, then we, we have no clothes to wear and no, we have no food to eat. What do you do? I didn't think much of the Kesha said, I'm not you know, happy with that example. Just keep another one. No, okay. Maybe they just say, okay, this you can go. Maybe you nicely go there. Huh? Oh, yeah. That's true. That makes some more sense, but still I want a better example. <laughs> yes. Complaining, endlessly complaining. Oh, yeah, okay. But look at it. I think it's a console and then the movies, movies. <laughs> there are Gisela's examples. So, going to the movies, going to the concerts, going to the bars, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, things that maybe you know many of you don't see anything wrong with those things. You know, going to the parties is like party animals, and um, um, this, uh, so. But we do need to see that the how you say the the other side of all these things we do. You know, always you know, often go to the movies or go to the you know concerts and you know being a couch potato and you know all that. The, those are the unnecessary. Actions. So those are the unnecessary actions, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So much nutrition. Thank you, brother. But they have good movies, Kishla. You may come and get. Kishala said, that is like a day star, you know. Good movies are like a day star once in a while, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And here Adisha makes another point that, uh, you know, we need to learn to do uh, the positive actions and once we do them, we should also dedicate them okay, properly. You not just do the positive actions, but we need to dedicate them properly and then always being mindful or watch our mind. <coughs> Uh, when we accumulate and do uh, positive actions, uh, we should not dedicate them um, just to fulfill um, what we call uh, marvels of this lifetime, you know, to be rich, to be famous, to be handsome, to be beautiful, to be influential, and all that. Yes, the karmas might, you know, ripen in those sense, but then in some way we are spoiling the greater purpose of our virtuous actions. You know, so we should, in other words, don't dedicate our uh, positive actions to be a billionaire and, uh, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop there. Okay. And then they know me, you know, and then they put the but things that, you know, if we do dedicate our marriage to be rich and famous and all that, yes, they may ripen. Then what happens is once the karmas ripen in that form, now we are rich or we are beautiful and famous, then that's the end of the story. Okay. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, if we dedicate our positive actions altruistically to become an enlightened being for the sake of all sentient beings, so until we reach the enlightened state, you know, our virtues or the positive or the marriage, uh, you know, they will keep on bringing you know good results. You know, they they become uh, they don't get exhausted after you know producing one kind of good result. Mm. And so that 
he don't get him rest. So therefore, I think altruistic dedication is very important. Ah, yeah. Ta, ti, ni, ti, ba, ni ba ni ba ti, ta to rang sin sharashis. No. Tu ta to ni, tu ta to ni rang sim le sharashis. No. Sharashis ni ta soba di jago ga. Na si so su so, so su sim shawa ti ki, so su le, so su do sin sharashis ni ki jago. And uh, the second half of the statement says, you know, as we mentioned before, that always we should um, uh, watch our mind. Uh, the Tibetan word that we use is like spy on our own mind. And how do we do that? Is we use a part of our mind to look at the mind itself. You know, what the mind is doing and thinking and, you know, so we need to uh, watch our mind. Yeah. Uh, maybe at times it's very difficult for us uh, to watch our mind at the same time and let the mind engage in certain activities because you know those two things is hard to handle. But uh, you know maybe before we do something, just we should look at our mind and think about what we're about to do, or is it the right thing to do, and so forth. Or maybe we engage in our action already, and then retrospectively look at the mind and say, okay, <coughs> was that the right thing, or you know, so maybe that's the way we can, uh, how should say, watch our minds. No. 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 Rangi gom jay to do. Rangi any lame menga nani, three rangs in GT, any gomba in Tani, any gomba in Tani, lame any sungi drips. And another point that Adisha makes is that, um, you know, we should um, um, pay uh, uh, attention to what Lama, meaning Guru or the teacher, tells us. Because as we rely upon their instruction, Menanga in Tibetan, sometimes translates as uh, quintessential instruction, pithy instruction, just instruction. Uh, anyway, when uh, we get the teaching or the instruction from Guru, then we also need to, I should say, um, I mean, listen to them. Yeah. that we should always listen to what the gurus tell us to do and listen to them. You know, of course, now this is based upon, it's premised on the thing that the gurus we are talking about are authentic and qualified gurus. You know, only then we could listen to them, whatever they say. You know. Rang any shower car drove in the any pictures in Roa Gita, Rang Pemba Timato, any Rang Mane King, and what the Guru are stating. Because whatever we do and we think it, that should accord with uh, the, the Dharma principles, you know, something that's beneficial, positive, that we are not contradicting Dharma principles and doing something wrong or going against it, you know. And authentic and qualified gurus will never tell us to do something that will contradict or go against Dharma. <laughs> So, in a sense that we also need to take time to investigate, uh, you know, uh, a person, uh, maybe before we accept him or her as our teacher. Because in today's time, you know, um, it's not necessary that everybody who calls himself or herself as a guru is necessarily authentic and, uh, you know, giving us authentic teaching because just have that title and then basically, uh, you know, they have their own hidden agenda, you know. And uh, so we do not want to be, um, I should say, um, uh, misled. Uh, by such uh, uh, such people, so it's very important for us to investigate the matter at hand, and then you know find a qualified teacher, and then listen to uh, the words. <coughs> so we will stop there, and we will give you the opportunity to ask some questions. Yes, please. How necessary is it to keep appraised of current events, to read the newspaper, watch the news? That's a 
Krishna said that in that case, you know, if there's something really we need to pay attention to, you know, in the news and the media, while we need to listen to, I mean, get to that, if it's a newspaper, I mean, whatever thing you need to read, but don't spend all time reading every piece of column and, you know, and make a habit of reading it every day, and then just, it's just a habit, you know. Yeah. Yes. Hello, yeah. Uh, if we were to make money mm-hmm. and we have good motivations mm-hmm. and to help to be up, mm-hmm. is that all right? I mean, it's not for our own purpose. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, so this is a, you know, it's not for our motivation. Yeah. <laughs> good. Sure. It's okay to put in the time mm-hmm. so this is not busy. Could be busy, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're making a very good point, Mimila, here that, of course, that probably goes more with what we call the perfection of generosity or dan parameter of bodhisattvas, right? Because, you know, in the practice of giving, you know, we talk about giving material things and, you know, that. Yes. And when we talk about, like, in terms of material giving or giving the, the material gifts, uh, the gifts should have been acquired properly, not in the sense of they got in a, through the wrong means of livelihood, right? We trick people, deceive people, and then go do stuff, and then give. It looks like we're very generous, but that doesn't work in some sense. That may mean say that the kuno number that we talk about, so so any to the so so any something that carry in the year, but you don't believe. Chawasa bo chebi. This chebi is this one. This that any so when the chong of chebi is that go. Yeah, yes, I mean, uh, you know, motivation plays a very essential and significant role. If the motivation is positive and good, right, in some sense, then that also, I mean, um, the, the, what we do, our action, it could be doing business, it could be, you know, doing any other kind of works, that will have a different meaning. You know, so somebody who really have good heart and good motivation, you know, engages in the business work and make money and then can help the poor and the needy or, as you said, you know, uh, a center or, you know, some needy uh, other institutions, you know. I think that way, uh, although we could be very busy in that sense, but then that busyness will have a different meaning in some sense, okay? It, it could be positive. They look too much. And then not to, of course, we follow uh, the rules and the laws of the land, not that, you know, go and break the, you know, laws of the land, doing business and, you know, uh, do all kind of uh, tax evasion. I didn't say that, but that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what the... No. This deduction is okay. This, this deduction is okay. Uh, tax deduction is all right, but... Uh, <laughs> We have numbers, this government. So, Gisela says, non-profit organizations like us, you know, we have to give you the tax distinction. That's not tax evasion, but... Uh, 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 I have a question here, Gisela. Uh, enemy is within... Is within. Uh, why do we have to find a quiet place and remain in solitude, away from place, uh, Causing arising of delusions, okay. Solid delusions. Ini kerana tak ngomong ada nang lalu yaris. Eni ini mungkin sahaja khusus buat siapa jual cincin, kawat dia dan itu yang kalau rok eh, ni mau pergi ke mana semero? Mereka tidak sebenar real yaris tak mana. Sahaja kalau sumber dia na tangi dia tu was. Yun ni nyawa ni apa? Sugi mai ni mau jadi sains. Tadi ani yun tak nyawa ni nyawa mana? Pak asal dari dia bi ini. Ni mau siapa ni yun rok yaris. Um, so the point here is, um, you know, yes, I mean, um, one of the points I made before was, as um, uh, Vashubandha said, you know, if we keep the objects which may ar- give rise to delusions at distance, then it's to that extent we experience less of delusions. Okay, so, so if you are in a solitude, right, you are not 
The objects which give rise to delusions are not in your proximity. You are in a peace, you know, solitude. So it does not mean that we will not experience any kind of delusions, but to a great extent, we will experience much less delusions. You know, rather than if we are in a crowd or, you know, near the objects of delusions. And that's what we're talking about. If somebody has never seen flowers in life, let's say, and is never nearby a flower, then that person will not have the attachment as a delusion to a flowers. Uh, let me give another example, like say, if somebody is, uh, you know, how to say, always eating the simple food, the, 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 you should get the name of like, uh, say, the Tibetan samba, you know, just the roasted barley flour and just simple stuff, and so really content with that, and has never been to restaurants and then don't know what is on the menu, then all that attachment other people have, what is on the menu and, you know, the smell and all this stuff, this person doesn't have, because has no clue. As I've never seen restaurants and don't know what menu is, you know, in the first place. See? So this person has much less attachment to food that we're talking about. Maybe have attachment to the little samba, but that's about it. <laughs> see? You know. It's just a... So that's why we are talking about watching the mind, because the enemy is within us, and wherever we go, you know, solitude or not, it is there inside. So we got to be very mindful, you know, of our mind. So I think we uh, will stop there today, because we have a uh, few announcements to make, and... Uh, and more announcements to make, I think. Uh, few is mine, and then there will be more. Um, uh, prayer requests uh, include, uh, let's see, uh, Catherine uh, Bruna, uh, as we requested you last time also, is, you know, she's in a very critical condition. Uh, so um, we would like to pray for her. And also... Um, uh, let me see, Miss uh, Niramol and Mr. Lake, and uh, they also have, um, you know, um, <coughs> physical ailments, uh, and um, so both are in Thailand, uh, off Thailand. <coughs> so we request you to join us in praying for them. No, no. ยอดดูเจริญสมบูรณ์ดูเจริญรอพี่เจ้าโมเนวอนเทศลองกุปรายโกท่านนี้ท่านหัวใจเนี่ยหัวใจก็อยู่เลยอันนี้ท่านสุ
May His Holiness the Dalai Lama and all other great and holy beings, uh, wherever they are, in any part of the universe, live long and be successful in fulfilling their visions, benefiting sentient beings. May spiritual communities throughout the world, as well as all spiritual practitioners, uh, remain healthy, harmonious, and be successful in fulfilling their spiritual aspirations. May our world, as well as other world uh, environments, be free of all kinds of unwanted pains and problems, and beings find peace, happiness, prosperity, and spirituality. In short, we dedicate our merit, a virtue, uh, for all kind mother sentient beings to be free from the fears and dangers of two types of mental obscuration, obscuration to nirvana and obscuration to omniscient state, and may we all reach complete enlightened state quickly. Yeah, Oh, 